Hello out there and welcome to your next mission video podcast. We have a great show today that focuses on finding your tribe after transition. Veterans John Snyder from HCA Healthcare and Michael McCoy from Verizon will join us to talk about some of the challenges our military service members face as they embark on that new chapter in their lives after military service. Where will they find that new career? And just as important, a community. You won't want to miss this one, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome to Your Next Mission video podcast, where we tell the stories of those who have served in the past and those who are serving today. From transition to financial wellness, VA benefits to mental health, we cover issues facing veterans, active military, and their families. Now here's your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Hello out there, warriors past and present, your families, and thank you for your service to our great country. Before we get started, I personally want to thank our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA for making your next mission happen. They love our veterans and families, and as I always say, we love them too. As I said earlier, we have a great show today focusing on a couple of big challenges of transitioning career and community. And I'm excited to introduce United States Army veteran John Snyder, Program Manager of Military Affairs for HCA Healthcare, and U.S. Army National Guard veteran Michael McCoy, Senior Manager, Military Recruitment Programs for Verizon. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sergeant Major. Hey, Sergeant. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can both talk at the same time. I love it. Keep that shows me you're motivated here a little bit. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. <laughs> hey, hey Sergeant Major, we appreciate being here. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on. God bless you, and uh, and thank you for all that you're doing for our veteran community. But before we get started, uh, would each one of you tell us just a little bit about yourself? And Michael, we'll we'll start with you. Yes, Sergeant Major, I appreciate that. So. Like uh, you said, I, I lead Verizon's military programs, and I've been in the Army National Guard for 12 years. So I'm, I'm still currently serving. Uh, I still have a role as a company commander in the Tennessee Army National Guard uh, in an ABCT. So still continuing that fight in the armor, armor world like you and have a lot going on on the recruiting side. So we lead teams on what, what we have is skill bridge opportunities, direct hire opportunities, uh, programs, traveling around, making sure that service members understand how to transition, military spouses, and and everything in between. Hey, you know, I, I love you talked about tanks. I don't know if you know this or not. I was on 48, 60s, A1s, A3s, and then put the first M1 program out in the United States Army. I, I love tanks. I haven't shot one for a while. Maybe someday I'll come and visit you guys. You let me, you know, get in there and shoot a couple of rounds here. <laughs> hey, John, what about come you? Ta- <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm on, I'm in right now. I'm just I'm going to mark that on my calendar. John, how about yourself? Tell the honest a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks, Sergeant Major, for having us. Um, like like you mentioned, I'm the program manager for military affairs for HCA Healthcare, uh, headquartered out of Nashville, Tennessee. I lead our military initiatives for the organization, which um, also encompasses uh, mil- our military recruitment efforts and how we're bringing in military affiliated talent into the organization, helping them to uh, find and create some new pathways uh, for that talent um, in, into HCA. Uh, a little bit about me is, um, you know, just like yourself, Sergeant Major, I, I enlisted right out of high school at the age of 17, served two years as an 11 Bravo, um, you know, did, got to do some pretty cool stuff. Um, you know, some of the cool guy badges, you know, as an infantryman, got to earn some of those. Um, and then uh, took a took a quick break and got a, uh, a scholarship to, to do the ROTC program at Middle Tennessee State University. And, um, you know, completed that program commission, went back into the infantry as an, as an officer, um, finished out my, you know, uh, service there as an inf- uh, infantry rifle platoon leader, um, as, as well as some uh, staff and, and company XO time. Yeah, there you go. The, uh, you know, the best years of my life, I think, were in the military. I had a great time serving in the military. And I, too, have some of those badges. In fact, uh, I used to tell people, I don't want any more because I have to get another ri- a row of ribbons to put on there. So, it's, you know, it costs you more money to put them on there. <laughs> hey, you both were veterans and, and both in a leadership position with top companies. First of all, let me say congratulations. On the surface, it would seem that, uh, you know, transition was easy. But, John, that really wasn't the case for you, was it? It, it was, Sergeant Major. Transition from active duty wasn't um, as easy as I thought it was. Um, 
you know, from, on a personal note, I was a little um, arrogant um, coming out. I didn't really know what to expect, um, but I also thought that, you know, um, every corporation of America would want to hire a veteran. You know, um, all these military friendly organizations that were out there, um, I thought it would be an easy transition for someone like me with my skill, uh, skill set and experiences to find an opportunity. Um, but that wasn't the case. Um, you know, in 2013, you know, when you looked at all the MOS skills translators out there, you know, you would type in 11 Bravo or 11 Alpha, you know, law enforcement or some version of law enforcement would populate. Um, and that's the route I ended up taking. Um, I, you know, ended up finding a few opportunities, you know, and had some interviews, but just had a hard time getting my foot into different organizations. And so law enforcement was, was the route that I ended up taking. Um, you know, I left Fort Benning, you know, now Fort Moore on a Friday. And that Monday I was getting my head shaved in the, in the police academy again, going <laughs> through, you know, the academy as a trainee. Yeah. Um, but for the first two years of, of, of my transition, I really struggled. I, even though I was surrounded by individuals, um, some being veterans, you know, from, from the GWAT era, um, I just, I really didn't felt like I, I belonged or, or fit into, you know, the, the law enforcement community um, or other communities that I was plugged into. Um, you know, for the first two and a half years, I held nine different positions with seven different companies. Um, I bounced around, tried my hand at a couple of different things, but I just, I really felt like something was missing. Like there was a void um, that I just couldn't fill. Um, now I had some, um, you know, personal struggles. I, I tried to fill that void with some unhealthy habits um, which I highly don't, you know, don't obviously don't recommend. Um, but that's why, you know, we're here having this conversation about community because, you know, instead of me going down a very dark, um, you know, extremely dark pathway, it was a community that really made a difference in my transition experience. You know, I was down a little uh, dark pathway. I had, you know, made a plan to, you know, to end my own life, um, you know, just because I didn't have a purpose, I didn't have a community that I could fit into, but it was somebody who, you know, invited me to an army Navy football game watch party in Nashville, Tennessee, that made a difference, you know, four quarters of a football game, you know, this community, even though I was not a West Point graduate or, you know, and a graduate of the Naval Academy, you know, this group, um, you know, welcomed me with open arms, you know, saw that I was struggling. And for four quarters of that football game, you know, I was given the skills and kind of some language that I needed to navigate the hiring process, you know, um, you know, with the different major organizations in the Middle Tennessee area. Um, the biggest thing that I walked away from with um, from that, you know, watch party game was not only just having a community, having a, you know, fifth squad an element that I could, you know, fall back on and lean on for support um, and find some additional guidance. But the biggest thing w was hope. Um, you know, hope to to keep fighting, to push forward, to stick it out a little bit, you know, longer to uh, to find find that opportunity. And six months later, after that football game, um, even though Army lost um, that year, you know, Ooh. I, I was able <laughs> <laughs> I was able to find the job that you know really uh, changed my life. The first job that I felt like I could make a difference, supply some of this you know skill sets as a you know an infantry JMO to you know, how we would train the next generation of physicians. Um, and, and it was all because of that community. Yeah. You, you know, a, a couple of things. First of all, <clears throat> I tell you, never think you're alone. I tell people this all the time, you know, because we're all part of a very small family, even though we think the military is a big family, you're never alone. There's always somebody out there to help you. In fact, uh, I tell people all the time, I'll help anybody I can. I'm just not going to give you any money. So that's it. The second, the second thing is, it, for you, and you touched on it there, it's it's a culture shock getting out of the military. I mean, we don't, we don't, we, we're our own worst enemy. We train people to, uh, let's be honest, we train people to kill people. Uh, and it's hard to turn that off. It's hard to make that adjustment. So when you get out of the service, you're saying, you know, life's okay, I can sort of fit right in. And the real answer is it takes a while. I've been out, geez, almost uh, just a little bit, probably over 20 years now. And I'm not necessarily sure I ever fit in, but I surround myself with uh, with people that talk military talk, so I feel pretty comfortable most of the time. And then, uh, and you got to do that, but uh, never think you're alone, John. There's always somebody there that uh, will assist you in any way you can. That's your mic. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, let me say one more thing too. Is is uh, 
family, spouses, military, I mean, all everybody around you, uh, you know, loves you in a different, you know, in a different way. And they'll, they'll help you and do everything they can to, to make sure that you're successful in life. And unfortunately, I, I need to tell this story too, is I had a good friend here a couple of years ago that, uh, that we served together for probably 30 years in the military and, and, uh, and he committed suicide. And I was just, and, and, and to this day, I think myself, I think, geez, if I'd have called him and talked to him and said something, would there have been a difference? And heck, I don't know, but, uh, you know, we're all part of a family, we all went through the same stuff, and we all need to make sure that we uh, help each other, no matter what rank you are, whether or not you're a private or a four-star general, we all struggle, that's true. Michael, in our prep call, you said transition is more like a team sport, not an individual, what do you, individual sport, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so just like you said, Sergeant Major, it's a it's a family, it's a community. You have people around you that can talk the same lingo, that can then help you navigate. Like John had at that football watch party, you know, you talk about surrounding yourself with people who continue to talk in, in military parlance. You know, that's that's your tribe, that's your community, and then finding that inside of an organization or inside of a community of organizations here in Nashville. Uh, Ted and I have, have started, you know, LinkedIn Music City years ago because we saw the need to bring together groups of individuals who were all doing the same thing alone, but looking at, at building it on the community of making sure everybody came together and had somebody that they could turn to, they could find that right resource. You know, and, and John and I both lead military recruiting programs. There's a finite number of veterans. You would think it's a zero sum game between us, but I email John veterans, John emails me veterans. I'm part of, you know, you had Candy Tillman on here, 50 strong and the collaboration that we have between those other employers. You know, I, I talk to those guys and gals weekly and it's a community. We're all here working for the ultimate, you know, purpose of, of serving veterans. And that is what we all work together to do. And it's, it's finding that community, not thinking that you're alone and working together to achieve your mission. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey uh, Michael, you talked, where do you think, you know, finding a tribe in the community ranks among, you know, among the factors of, of transition out of the military? Is that really the most important thing? I'd say so. I, I think it starts, you know, we talk about TAP is required 365 plus, but you you have this community, people you served with, like you mentioned, Sergeant Major, you, you served with a gentleman for 30 years. There's people I know and John knows that they served with. That's your tribe and, and keeping that connectivity together and, and building that community. And so when somebody gets out and they cycle out of that unit or, or whatnot, you got to stay in touch. You got to figure out what mechanisms you need to, to stay in contact with the people around you and, and add in new people to your orbit. You know, those are things that make you successful during transition and, and keep you from losing that light at the end of the tunnel. You know, we always say, we'll see you on the high ground. We'll see you on the other side. That's where the other side is. It's it's that light at the tunnel. It's that community. It's getting through that first transition challenges, the first 30 days, the first 90 days that are probably the hardest. I mean, Sergeant Major, when, when somebody called you Jack the first time, you were like, who who's Jack? I don't know, Sergeant Major. <laughs> You're <me>. exactly right. <laughs> and, you know, I, it's it's figuring out who Jack is. It's who's Michael, who's John. And, and it's that tribe that'll help you help you get there. Yeah. It's really funny when you said that because, you know, you have a, uh, somebody that's is a mayor for, you know, one term. They call him for the mayor for the rest of his life. And here a guy like me or, or you guys too, uh, I spent like 36 years in the Army and I lose that identity when you get out. I mean, you, you stay around the community, still call you that and makes you feel good. But uh, you're really right. I mean, that's... Uh, I, I, I tell you the truth, when people when people call me that initially, I said, that sort of pissed me off a little bit. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, you want to add anything to that? that well, I, you know, I think Michael's, um, you know, completely right. I mean, there's an element of, of finding yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, but um, when it comes to finding the career, you know, community also has to be an element in there. It has to be done, you know, in parallel. You know, you have to learn a little bit, you know, about yourself during that transition process, um, you know, but, you know, for folks like us on this, you know, on this podcast, I mean, from the time that we stepped off the bus at, you know, reception at basic training, you know, we're, we're given a battle buddy, we're in a team environment, right? And, you know, what we don't realize is that when we transition that team element that you've been a part of, whether it's at the team level or, you know, brigade level, that team's not transitioning back with you. And it's extremely important that, you know, 
uh, soldiers and their families find, you know, career opportunities that have great communities already established in them. Um, but also, you know, helping, they have to identify what is their tribe in the areas that they're, they're relocating back to. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here lately I've been talking, you know, I called the, uh, I called the G1 here a couple of weeks ago, and I said, uh, why don't we put uh, transition or culture changes into our educational system uh, to start talking to people about, you know, because we talk to people about getting out of the military, in some cases six months a year, in some cases two years, but, uh, but it's not long enough. It doesn't give enough time uh, to, to work through those issues. And so I said, why don't we start talking about it, you know, maybe about your when you come into the service, about what kind of culture it's going to change, what you're going to meet into. There's a lot of little small things that we ought to you know, start talking to people about. The other thing is benefits and entitlements and stuff like that. But uh, I just think, uh, I think that's tied to suicide. I think that shock that when you get out that you just don't fit in, you can't find your tribe, that's, that's really a struggle. And, and unfortunately, uh, some of the people that we serve with, uh, our brothers and sisters there, that uh, that go home and sit on the couch and don't move, and uh, and you know what happens to them. It just it's it's really it's a terrible situation. The other thing I think is really a struggle, and 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 me and Ted and a lot of guys talk about this all the time. But but it, unless you've walked in my boots, you you, you don't get it. Uh, you think you do, uh, but it's it's totally different for all of us. Uh, everybody has you know you're eleven Bravo. I don't Michael was you well, I don't know was you eleven Bravo too I didn't know what your MO was nineteen nineteen I'm, tank, I'm sorry always a tanker. Armor. I'll well always no no a yeah, always a tank well so but you both understand uh, the things that you had to do and you had deployments and all those other things so it's it's difficult to make that adjustment. Uh, I think the less time you have in the military the easier it is, but the more if you stay twenty years or like I said myself it, it makes it uh, it makes a lot di- a lot more difficult. One last thing, we'll take a quick break here, is I think having your family involved in that process, too, is important. Uh, and I think you got to communicate, get them involved, bring them to the transition points with you, and do all the things that sometimes they don't want you to do, I guess, but but like making sure that they're involved in the process. This is a great, great discussion. We're going to take a quick break, so don't you guys go in, but we'll be right back. We're talking with veteran John Snyder from HCA Healthcare and Michael McCoy from Verizon. And you're watching your next mission video podcast with me, your host, Jack L. Tilly, 12th. I like saying that Sergeant Major stuff, Sergeant Major of the Army. Don't forget, if you're enjoying this discussion, and I know you are, because this is something that, that helps all of us. It's being honest, straightforward about some of the concerns and some of the issues that we have. Please like us. Click on that subscribe button below and also click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications of all of our upcoming video podcast releases. John, Michael, before we get into the policies and practices your companies have in place for veterans in, your, in the workforce, I'm wondering if you have any ideas about you know, what the Army or, or really or any other service branches might make, you know, make transition easier. Any ideas about recommendations for not just the Army, all the rest of the service too? We're all in this together. Uh, Michael, we'll start with you. Yes, sir, Major. You know, I, I think you're 100% spot on. We need to start talking about transition in NCOSs, in, in OMPs, and, and talking about what does life look like? What are the skills that translate from what you're doing now to what you could do in the future? You know, we have the PACE program, which guarantees you an interview at the end of your, your contract for those early career junior enlisted soldiers. But how are we inculcating career readiness across the force. We look at, you know, maneuverability. We look at the interoperability between the different maneuver branches. You know, we've went to centers of excellence. We're working on professionalization of our our military and building in civilian careers, certifications, training, and development that we don't have currently available in the military, I think is a great pathway. We already have TWI, uh, but I, I talked to a lot of those PMs and and people don't participate. They don't know it's out there. You talked about not knowing about what benefits you're going to have and you could have. You know, that's a, a one that we see hardly any participation in. Transportation Corps hasn't had a, a robust class in years. They're to onesies and twosies. So talking about transition, the skills you have and how to get involved in your tribe, your community and, and build it throughout your career, I think are, are things that could benefit your career while you're in. You know, you, you just talked about calling the G1. I'm in the National Guard. There's 8,000 people in in Tennessee. You know, I know people across other states, but sometimes to get something done, 
I got to pick up the phone and call headquarters because I know, you know, Greg, I know Matt, I know John, I know Sarah, I know Sally. When I have a soldier that needs something, I pick up the phone and call, you know, our, our education benefits office because I know them and, and building that community inside the military is just as important outside, which will help that transition process because you'll, you'll build those relationships, you'll build those skills and talk about it. Everybody has a military expiration date. I always, I always tell people that. And if you pretend that it's not going to happen, you're just hurting yourself because everybody has to get out of the army, no matter whether it's, you know, after that first contract or after 30 plus years. You know, Mike, you hit right on those. I never thought I'd ever get out of the service. I mean, I had, you know, 30 plus years, went to be the sergeant major in the army and, and really, I didn't think about it. I think, you know, somebody's going to take care of me. Somebody's going to, you know, help me guide, you know, I, I just, I was just crazy and naive really about it, but uh yeah, everybody's got an end date, but uh, that's great. J John, same question. How about yourself? Do you think the other services are in transition? Any ideas or thoughts about that? Well, Sergeant Mayor, I, I think we're we're being faced with a very unique challenge right now. You know, with looking at the the workforce of you know the actual um, you know U.S. Armed Forces. You know, we're we're down in recruitment and retention and um, across all branches. Um, and it's creating stressors on the transition process for those who do have that military expiration date that have already identified that. Um, you know, what folks like Mike and I, you know, are seeing across the board is that, you know, soldiers are are not able to participate in some of the current transition programs that are made available to them. Um, and, and that's unfortunate, or at least not to its full full extent. You know, we're seeing that some branches are uh, putting up restrictions that if you're above the rank of E7, you're not going to participate in the DOD skill bridge opportunity or the Army Career Skills Program. You know, we're, we're having soldiers tell us, hey, I can't participate. I'm, I'm above the rank of E7 or my command team has, you know, not approved it because they can't backfill the billet or they need me for the next six months. And, th and, that, and that's a challenge. Um, another, another, you know, thing that we're seeing um, scenario is, you know, uh, prorating the service member's time to participate in skill bridge based on their years of service. And man, I, based on my experiences, you know, from my own transition, it breaks my heart for that, you know, E4 and E5 transitioning out with no degree with, you know, three to five years worth of service and ha they have no idea what they truly want to do. They don't know what that pathway is. And they were only given you know, two to three weeks of like a job shadowing experience to help bridge that gap. And that is not enough. Sergeant Major, you know that, you know, if you put a soldier out in the land nav course without a map or a compass, yeah, they're, they're not coming back on, on that, you know, in that time requirement, right? Yeah. They're not going to meet the the standard of, of you know, uh, of getting all their points. That's just like that transition experience. We're, we're, get, we're putting them in, putting our families and soldiers in difficult situations where we're putting them on a land nav course without the tools that they need to, to, um, to survive and find that next opportunity. So, you know, I, I think the answer is simple. We have to, you know, have senior leaders, um, you know, or have senior leaders held accountable for allowing their soldiers um, to participate in these programs. Um, I think another element, Sergeant Major, is, um, you know, I, I've, I've been out for a little bit, so this may have already happened, but you know, we, we got to do some, you know, coaching, you know, with, with our, our soldiers on um, saying, hey, it's OK to have a hobby outside of work. Right. You know, my hobby, you know, when I when I was enlisted and even through the ROTC you know, program was, you know, trying to be the best infantryman, try to perfect that field craft, you know, to be that expert, you know, infantryman. You know, so when I found myself transitioning out before I had anticipated I didn't really know what my interests were or what, you know, hobbies I may want to try to leverage as career opportunities. And so I think we have to incorporate some better ways that, you know, we help coach uh, soldiers on how to find hobbies and interests and, and healthy hobbies and interests that align with um, not only their personal interests, but also possibly even career interests. Um, and then incorporate that in some of the evaluations, you know, letting soldiers know what exactly um, the what the value is that they bring to the team. So when they do transition out, they can look back at all those records and saying, hey, all my command teams and all um, of you know, my peer evals state that I'm really good at X, Y, and Z. Now they have a few benchmarks that they can utilize to take into uh, different job, uh, job interviews, as well as 
you know, helping to utilize those to find that next opportunity. Yeah. You, you know, you said some, what you both said is, is really right on target. One of the things I will say, though, is usually it's down at the command level. I, I would probably say lieutenant colonel or company commander that says, and, and, and nothing wrong about because you guys are young guys, but sometimes that young company commander will make the wrong decision about allowing that individual soldier to go on a certification program or whatever, the skill bridge program that, that he's going to. And so that's that's really bad. I used to tell people at every level that uh, I worked uh, in that I'd say, if you know, if I need to send a soldier to school or he needs to do something, I would, I would go short to allow him to go to school. Uh, because if I don't send him to school, what I do is I hamper his development. Uh, you know, he can't get promoted. He doesn't go to the right schools and all other stuff. So I'm, I'm slowing him down because he's such a good soldier. I'm going to take that away. It's the same thing with, with processing out of the service. If you allow a person to leave the military, and we're talking about the Army right now, but leave the military and, and don't take care of them when they get out, what are they going to do when they get out? They're going to talk bad about the military. You know, don't go in the military. Why? Because I spent four years in the military. I wanted to take six months to prepare to get out, and they wouldn't do anything for me. Uh, that's crazy. That's that's a, a unfortunate thing. But I, again, I tell you, it's it's probably down at that young captain or or uh, lieutenant colonel below. Uh, I remember one time when I was uh, in the first armor division, we had uh, uh, family time every Thursday. We had we had sergeant's time training in the morning and in the afternoon at uh, starting at two o'clock. I think it was family time. And every day, and uh, if I was in division headquarters, I'd walk around uh, division headquarters. And if I seen a soldier or somebody in there working on something, I said, I'd tell them to get out. And and some of the officers say, Sergeant Major, I got to do something. I don't care what you got to do. If you don't like what I'm saying, go see the general down there. He's still there, and we're going to leave together in a few minutes. Never would say anything. So I, I'd put their butt out of the uh, <clears throat> out of the office. But you have to do things like commanders have to do that. That's for true. Well, one of the questions I think you led on a little bit, John. So I'm going to start with you. You know, there are a whole lot of veterans out there. Why don't we utilize them as mentors? You know, I call them either sponsor or mentors. I mean, I think the number I, I heard before was like 17 million uh, veterans that are out there. A lot of people would love to go back and help people like yourselves, uh, help them transition out of the military. I think it's a good way to do it. And I, I, I keep telling people we ought to be doing that, but they're, but they're not doing it. I think we should do it. I, I just asked you your thoughts about that. Yeah, well. You know, to my own back to my transition story, I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. Um, and I I think that's the big challenge is that many veterans they transition out and don't know how to stay plugged in or or, or you know s- still help support and serve you know our community that they've been a part of. And so I think that's why you know you know programs like the American Corporate Partners uh, Mentorship Program, the Three Rangers Foundation, uh, the key community out in San Antonio and, and other parts of Texas are so vital to, you know, leverage the veteran community or military community in general to help support, you know, those brothers and sisters in arms that are, are currently transitioning out, looking for some support, looking for community. Um, and so I think we just need to do a better, um, you know, uh, job at communicating out how to get involved yeah. as they do transition. And maybe that's, we, we need to include that in the the TAPS process. Mark, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, you, you know, Sergeant Major, I, I've watched all the episodes, big fan. And so uh, <laughs> I know this is something you talk about to everybody, yeah. and, and I 100% agree. You know, go, keep going back to that community aspect. This is your tribe. You know, you want to turn around and lift the next guy or gal up. This is this is what intrinsically that, that service means to us. And, you know, I, I just – we were talking about it a few minutes ago. I just read Scott Mann's book of of the group of veterans who work together to to bring Afghanistan uh, interpreters and special forces out of the country in the last days. And, you know, that intrinsic need and want to serve and give back to others is why we all joined. And we all just are looking for that effort and opportunity when we transition out to give back. You know, I, I not to get too much off topic, when I talk to soldiers that that don't know what they want to do in a new city, I tell them to think about what they're interested in. And then find a nonprofit doing that and look at the companies that are sponsoring it because that's your tribe. We had a, a, a first sergeant out of Fort Campbell had a, a daughter with Down syndrome, and this was years ago. And I, I said, you know, first sergeant, you're involved in Best Buddies, right? He was like, yes, sir, I, I am. And I said, go and talk to the people over there. Tell them what you want to do and ask who their points of contact are at the biggest involved, most involved companies here in Nashville. You know what? He went out and he found his tribe, and, and that's what it's about. And we just have to figure out how we can give ourselves – that grace to give back and say, Hey, I know, I don't think I know what I'm talking about, but I just want to help. 
And I think that it's our own personal blockers saying, hey, I don't know enough to help. And so I'm not a subject matter expert. And so I'm just not going to help because I, I don't want to hurt. But in reality, all of our experiences are invaluable and unique, and you never know what's going to help somebody. Yeah, I would tell you, I'm not shy. <laughs> I'm not afraid to ask that question. I used to tell people, you don't like it. You don't, if you don't like uh, the answer that I give your questions, don't ask the question. You know, I'm out there trying to, to get a job done. Hey, we're going to talk about your businesses and what you're doing for veterans right after a quick break, so a commercial break. So sit tight. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back. You're watching Your Next Mission video podcast. You're watching Your Next Mission video podcast, proudly presented by Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Purdue Global you're ready for a comeback, and with Purdue Global, you can do more than take classes. You can take charge of your story, of your career, of your life. Earn a degree you can be proud of and get an education employer's respect. Start your comeback at purdueglobal.edu. USAA. Oh. A promise is a trust not to be broken. Right, Whether spoken with an oath or sealed with a pinky. And after 100 years, we're still taking care of the military community and their families. That's our mission, always. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with John Snyder, Program Manager of Military Affairs for HEA Healthcare, and Michael McCoy, Senior Manager of Military Recruitment Programs for Verizon. And I want all of our viewers to reach out to directly. Tell us about your transition. Tell us what topics you'd like us to cover. I always tell everybody, this is not my show. This is, this is our show. I want to help you as much as I can. The only thing I'm not going to do is give you any money, but I'm going to help you. You can call or text me at 844-424-1134, and I'll reach out to you. Or send me an email at uh, smatilly at yournextmission.org. We're heading into our final state with you, and I, I just enjoyed this discussion a whole lot. I hope you've enjoyed it just as much as I have. I just have a couple more questions. I'd like to hear about what kind of hiring programs your companies have to uh, attract veterans. And John, well, let's start with you. What's your approach? So HCA Healthcare has had a dedicated military recruitment program for 12 years now. Um, we founded ours in 2011. Um, and what we've done over the last 18 months is changed our tactics to to not only attract, but, you know, hire in military affiliated talent um, because the needs of our uh, servicemen and women and their families are changing. You know, what they were 12 years ago, it's different from what it looks like right now. And so we're adapting to that changing in, um, landscape. Um, and so, you know, what our approach is, you know, at HCA is really to, to meet the needs of our um, servicemen and women. Um, today and tomorrow. So we're really trying to leverage different programs that are out there, you know, through par uh, strategic partners like 50 Strong, uh, the, you know, leveraging the DOD, you know, Skill Bridge program, hiring our heroes, different fellowships that they have, the DOD's MSCAP program to really create pathways for, um, you know, service members and their families to find opportunities in healthcare. Um, you know, I'm a little biased, but I'm, I'm trying to create a program, you know, at HCA that I needed 10 years ago. You know, being that infantryman and not really knowing what I wanted to do or what was even available to me um, and, and creating this kind of almost a white glove service with coaching, you know, servicemen and women on, you know, what opportunities are, are you know, can be in front of them based on, you know, what they've done in the military, their, uh, you know, actual career goals and interests are. Um, and so we've really been able to to exhaust our, you know, veteran, you know, employee resource group. Um, to help offer some level of mentorship and coaching to find that opportunity um, so HCA can truly be a military thriving organization. We don't want it to be just a transaction where, you know, we go out to a bunch of military recruitment events, we hire you into the organization, and that's the last time we speak. We want to make sure that we're creating a culture that our um, servicemen and women can truly thrive in. And it all starts with the hiring process and making sure that we're getting hired into the right position. And so that's kind of our approach right now is, is really taking a, a tailored custom approach to meeting the needs of Sergeant Major Tilly rather than bucket you know type programs 
um, to try to put people into. Yeah. Uh, Michael, same question. How about Verizon? What are they doing? Yeah, we do a lot of the same stuff John does. You know, we we look at it in a couple of different buckets. So we have the transitioning service member bucket that we're able to really utilize some of those specific programs like hiring our heroes, like John mentioned, the transition program assistance programs on, on direct placement through uh, events on post and on base. We're looking at skill bridge and how we leverage that across different, you know, the formations. So those are those big transition programs where we're actively tapping into, hey, I'm I'm zero to 60 days out or I'm, you know, I'm, I just left yesterday. I don't know what to do. And then we look at that that veteran bucket. We get hundreds of thousands of applications a year for all of the jobs here at Verizon. And so what my team does is we're aligned across the different business groups here inside of Verizon. And we coach, mentor, and train our recruiters to know what a veteran looks like. Because I don't want somebody to ever tell me, I didn't know the military did that. That means I failed. And so we work actively to make sure our recruiters, our businesses, our business leaders know what do we have in the military? What skills and experiences are we bringing forward and how they can work inside of their segment? Uh, those are those big pieces where we're, we're across the board engaging. And then obviously we're involved in events and, and all over the country. Uh, we have a lot of different parts and pieces that are moving at all times to make sure that we're out there. Uh, we're a, an understood brand. Most people think of us as, hey, Verizon's just the cell phone store on the corner. When in reality, we're one of the nation's largest technology companies. And, and most people don't think of us that way. A third of the world's internet moves through Verizon's networks. Wow. A third of the world's internet. That know, is man. a lot of that internet. No joke. Yeah. And, and so we need, you know, those 25 uniforms, you know, we need that whole signal core. Just come on over. We got you. And, you know, we have that opportunity to really share our stories. And, and that's how we're kind of making sure that everybody knows, hey, Verizon has a place for you no matter what you're doing. Hey, Mike, how do you guys market it? How do you tell people about your product? I mean, how do you get to work? Two questions. How do you market it? And do you go on military installations to talk to veterans on military and spouses too? Mike, we asked you, same question back to you too, John, but go ahead, Michael. Uh, yes, I'm Major. So we do. Uh, we have a lot of different moving parts and pieces. Uh, so we're on military installations. We have a, a base engagement strategy that aligns to our regional major hubs to make sure that when I show up, I can say, hey, here's jobs geographically aligned to you, where we're at right now, and the skills and experience I know that we're going to see at, at Fort Cavazos, at Moore, at Bliss, you know, at Savannah, and wherever we're at. And so we're we're right there with the right jobs in the right place. And then what else we're doing to market it is we're in magazines, we're in GI Jobs, uh, we're the presenting sponsor for the San Diego Veterans Day Parade. Uh, we're in the New York City Veterans Day Parade. We'll see a million people uh, across both of those events. And so we're, we're always involved. We have military and veteran discounts for both of our business customers and our consumer customers. Uh, we're involved in so many different events across the country that are not recruiting specific. They're just community givebacks, you know, the Honor Foundation, um, ACP, like John mentioned, a lot of those other organizations where we're trying to give more than what we're trying to get. Yeah. yeah. yeah and that's really tried to articulate that. Yeah. John, same question. Before you go there, though, now, Michael, if you need somebody doing all that sponsorship, if you know Marshall, somebody to wave your hand, just call on me. I'll go up there. Hey, I don't go. I'll help Verizon out. Go ahead. John, same question. How do you get, do you get on military installations? How do you market uh, to tell veterans about your product, about hiring uh, jobs there that you have? Yeah, absolutely. So, Sergeant Major, I, I'm actually at Fort Bliss right now. You know, so there's a military recruitment event going on, you know, with Hiring Our Heroes um, coming up shortly. Uh, so I'll be participating in that. But um, we are always visible on, you know, majority of our, um, you know, garrisons across the country. Um, you know, we we maintain a presence. We, we leverage our military liaisons at HCA, so one in each division, uh, to get out there, maintain relationships with our transition assistant program offices, um, across multiple installations within their markets, um, making sure that, you know, our brand is is presence, right? Because it's just like if you have a battalion commander and it's never around, you know, you know, soldiers at, you know, at the team level, that that so that private first class is not going to know who the battalion commander is. Yeah. And so what we try to do is maintain visibility um, and be consistent with showing up. And if we tell if we tell you that H is going to be there, we're going to have some opportunities to show you. We show up and we show up, you know, and and over deliver with what we, you know, what we're bringing to the table. 
Um, and so that that's that's a big part of our, our strategy is getting out there, letting people know that we're here to offer some support, offer you know opportunities at HCA, and really tell them a little bit about who we are and, and what our mission is. Um, you know, Michael hit on something, you know, that is extremely important. It's not necessarily just about, you know, giving money to different organizations just so, you know, you can slap your name on. It's 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 about showing up. It's that action piece um, and, and making sure that, um, you know, you're you're putting your money where your mouth is. And if you want to be, um, you know, engaged and, and active in the military community, it's it's more than just giving, a, a, you know, one hundred thousand dollars to you have to show up and participate and get involved and and do all the things that Michael was talking about. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll take the hundred thousand. There's no problem about that. But, <laughs> but, but the other thing I'll tell you though, is they've got to see that you care. Yeah. Uh, if, if you go and you're there and you get involved, in fact, one of the things I did when I was on active duty, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I've transitioned. Okay. But I would, uh, my brain was, uh, you know, 365 days a year. I was a soldier, uh, you know, it, it didn't stop on Fridays or Saturdays or Sundays or whatever. I was, and I was always going to the unit. So if people know that you care, uh, they'll do all they can to help you out. They're, the second thing I'll tell you, Ted may get mad at me about this one, but you ought to put some of those jobs that you have on our website, American Freedom Foundation website, uh, to help veterans and family, because you just never know. We started, oh, no. yeah, go ahead. You want to say something, Michael? I, I was, I was going to say, you know, being there and, and showing you care. So well, I've, I've been around you and known you for a while now and we were at an event together and there was a retiring first sergeant and he he was talking to me and he's like hey i'm nervous to go talk to sergeant major when i was a private 20 years ago <laughs> sergeant major of the army came to our base and he did a one-handed push-up competition with us and just had a blast and this was 20 years later at a career event here yeah. in nashville that that soldier remembered because yeah. of you showed them how much you cared and how engaged and involved you were. Yeah. And you know, that, that story just, it sticks with me. It, it's just great of, of how much the community continues to give to each other because that, that fabric and that network that we have and the connection is ubiquitous. I mean, you go somewhere, you meet someone new. I had never talked to him before in my life and we were just talking and you were across the room and he was like, Listen, this one time, and I made him go over there and tell you that story. And it was, <laughs> yeah, I it remember was like, that. That's our major, I, I, you know, and it's just great of how much that matters to us because we want to see that we care and that other people around us care. And that's 100% what we definitely try to do. Well, you know, I, I, I used to tell people, I, I, uh, I was the a soldier for a long time. I love the Army, but, but I love all the people in the Army. And I, no matter who you meet and who you talk to, I think it's important for you to do, you know, whatever you can to help them, uh, whether or not it's giving them some kind of direction or focus or a pat on the back or a kick in the butt, whatever you got to do to help them out. But uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I always, me and Ted always talk about the fact that we'll help soldiers till the day we die. So that's that's important. And we started things out by talking about finding a community after transition. So Michael, is building and maintaining a feeling of community among the Verizon. Uh, veterans, is it difficult to do? You know, we're, we're a big company like HCA. Uh, we have 100,000 people. About almost 10% of our workforce are veterans. And so that's that's just veterans. That's not the military-connected community. So our, our employee resource group has about 8,000-plus active members. And that includes veterans, military spouses, family members, Gold Star family members, Blue Star families, and everybody's passionate. Everybody wants to get involved and, and stay engaged. And so we have uh, 10 regions across the country. And so we we're able to make it local. And I think that's one of the things that really matters as well, because if, if you know, we're talking about going to the San Diego Veterans Day Parade and being there, the people in Omaha don't care. I mean, they care, but it, it doesn't impact them. And so it's how can we show up in that local community for that population that we have around those different geographic locations, like John mentioned of having the regional leads. You know, we've got to make sure that everybody is active and engaged and gets that opportunity to get involved. And, and that's how we keep that that momentum and pace going, because we do have so many different moving parts and pieces and those opportunities. Uh, and so we don't have a, hardly any trouble getting people to, to want to stand up and raise their hand and say, hey, I want to help. You tell me where you need me and I will help. Yeah. John, same question. How about HCA and the community at a point of emphasis for you? Is that a, a really important for you guys? I'm sure it is. Sorry, Major. Community, community is mission critical at HCA, right? I mean, all the efforts and, and all the traveling with and to getting all to you know to all these military garrisons to hire in military talent at HCA, 
you know, if if we don't have a strong community that they can get plugged into day one, then we're just adding to all the, you know, the stats that are out there about, you know, veterans leaving their first job in an X amount of time. We have to have a strong community HCA. It is, is extremely mission critical. It's why we stood up our military colleague networks to only include, you know, our, our veterans, our National Guard and Reservists, our, our active and veteran military spouses, and even, you know, our advocates, you know, advocates of, of, of military personnel. Um, you know, we're la- we've launched these communities across our entire organization, across 300, over 300,000 employees at this point. Um, you know, 20 different states and the United Kingdom. So that way, when we hire Sergeant Major Tilly in, in, you know, a specific division, you have a specific contact and a group, a community that you can get plugged into day one, because no matter how hard you've prepped and you, um, you know, sketched out your plan for transition, there was some element of your transition that you didn't prepare for. And when you did, when you get hit with that, that curveball and that stress, you're going to need a community, that tribe to fall back on like, hey, guys, here's my issue. How did you guys navigate this, this, um, you know, this particular process or this challenge? And so it's, it's, it's extremely uh, critical for us to establish a community and help, you know, maintain the engagement and strength of, of that community across our organization. Yeah. Well, well, let, let me tell you, first of all, thanks so much for coming on the show. You guys are unbelievable. I mean, you're, you're uh, it, it makes me feel good to see uh, a couple of veterans out there helping other veterans and families. And you guys are doing uh, uh, God's work, and just keep up a good job. Any way that I can help you uh, anytime, please let me know. I certainly appreciate it. Any, uh, John, we, I always went to Michael first. So I'm going to go to you first this time. Any final thoughts, anything you want to share with the audience maybe we missed? Oh, absolutely. Sorry, Mitter. I always have three pearls of wisdom that I leave most folks with. Uh, the first one I'm going to tell you, what you hit on earlier, I think, in the podcast was is around don't stop doing PT. Just because you hang up your uniform the last time doesn't mean you you know stop you know you know taking care of yourself you know HCA Healthcare Verizon we're not going to ask to, you know you to run that five mile in less than forty minutes or do X number of push ups or sit ups you know a certain amount of time but stay active keep moving because not only is it a good way for you to take care of yourself you know physically it also gives you an outlet to, to take care of yourself emotionally and spiritually. You know, so when you do get, you know, different stressors thrown at you during that transition process, you have a healthy outlet to help push that stress onto something else. You know, the second one, you know, is, is you got, you have folks like myself, Mike, and and many others, Candy Tillman, 50 Strong, who are champions and advocates in your corner, just like you, Sergeant Major, you're, you're a champion for our community. But if these transitioning service members don't leverage us or don't reach out to us, I can't help you. So you have to reach out and leverage the army that you have, um, you know, available to you in your corner. Um, and then the last one um, is it's okay to ask for help. Yep. You have to have a little level of humility and, you know, lower your pride a little bit to say, I'm, I'm not the subject matter expert in this particular area. I need some help or I need some guidance on navigating this particular challenge or process. It's okay to ask for help. This is some, you know, for some folks transitioning out, this is the first time that they're ever going to be interviewing, you know, within a corporation, um, you know, and there may be their last, you know, interview may have been their NCO board that they were a part of, but this is the first time that they've navigated this process and they're not going to be the subject matter expert and they have to have some humility to ask for help. Well, I mean, those are three great recommendations. <laughs> Let me tell you real quick now. I, I'm this, you probably laugh when I tell you this. Every day I do something for at least an hour. So Monday I go to the gym. Tuesday I play golf. Wednesday I go to the gym. Thursday I play golf. Friday I go to the gym. Saturday I go to the gym. Sunday I go to the gym. Monday I go to the gym. Tuesday I play golf. So I got it down pat. I told my doctor that the other day that uh, that I told him what I was doing. He says, you're probably more active than a lot of people your age. They always bring your age up here, your age. So I said, well, that's okay. But, but and then I told him, I said, I probably could outrun you. He said, you probably could. Kind of work out. <laughs> the other thing is, and you hit it on the top. Like, again, the other thing you said was, I really love, ask for help. You're never by yourself. And I think sometimes uh, uh, people like us that uh, served in the military are afraid to ask for any help. I, never be afraid. If you if you got a concern and you want to ask a question, ask it. Because you don't know unless you ask it. So thank you so much. Michael, how about yourself? Yeah, no, John, John put it great. Uh, you know, stay involved, stay active and ask for help. You know, those three 
words of wisdom will really carry you forward for the full transition and, and most of the rest of your career. You know, it, it's all about finding that community, figuring out where you're going to go, you know, that distance direction azimuth, and, you, and you're set. And getting involved, staying involved will help you be successful. Well, God bless you both. And, and again, thanks a lot for what you're doing, what you could do. And thanks for coming on the show. It was, uh, it was great just talking to you guys. And keep up the good work. And, and again, let us know if we can help you anytime. Absolutely. Thanks, Sergeant Major. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks to John Snyder, Program Manager of Military Affairs for HEA Healthcare, and Michael McCoy, Senior Manager of Military Recruitment Programs for Verizon, for, for being with us today. Thank And thank you for watching. I'm Jack F. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major in the Army. You've been watching Your Next Mission video podcast. Please visit our website at yournextmission.org and leave me a review. I always tell people, oh, it's a good one, but evidently every once in a while I'll get a bad one. But I, we need to get better all together as a team. You can also visit our nonprofit or corporate partners where we can, you can see all the jobs and services that are available that will assist you in your transition from the military. Please know we want to assist you any way we can. I always love saying this twice. Please know we, Michael and John, please know we all want to assist you any way we can. You can follow me on all my personal social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Rumble. And I'll tell you right now, I never thought I'd ever say that. If you enjoyed this discussion today with John and Michael, I, I know that you have, please like us. Click on that subscribe button. And don't forget, click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications about upcoming video podcast releases. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. You can leave me a message or send me a text at 844-424-1134 or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. Thanks again to John Snyder from HEA Healthcare and Michael McCoy from Verizon for joining us today. It was just, it was just great having them on the show. And, and I think John and Michael probably said a lot, a lot better than I could. Yeah, you're not by yourself. Uh, stay physically fit and mentally tough and get out and help each other. Never think that you're alone. We're all part of a family. I, I joke about this all the time. We're all part of a family. I don't think I can give you any money, but... But we are part of a family. We've all struggled together. We've all walked in the same boots. We all did the same kind of things that sometimes we look at that maybe we're not proud of or maybe we are proud of. But we're all part of a family. We're part of a team. So never think you're alone. There's always somebody out there that uh, will help you and assist you any way that they can. That's you and your, and your families. I'm not just talking about you. I'm talking about families, too. They're so important for all of us. Uh, again, thanks for watching. And thanks to... New Mind Studios, and of course, our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USA. We appreciate all you do for our military. And as always, see you on the high ground. hoo -ah! You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.